very famous passage. There's a lot of good verses in here where he warns about the leaven of the Pharisees, about the, the doctrine of the Pharisees, these false prophets and the things they teach. He goes on and, and uh, Peter makes the profession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus says, that's what I'm going to build my church on. That's what the New Testament, the new covenant is all about, is believing that Jesus was God, believing that he is the Savior, the Messiah. Look at verse number 18 in this chapter. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus Christ, the rock that the church is built on, he says, it's my church. He said, hell will not prevail against it. I don't care what the devil has in store. They cannot stop God's people. They cannot stop God's people from being successful at preaching the gospel. Hey, and there will be times of tribulation. But Jesus is teaching something here about the authority that Jesus says, this is my church, right? Jesus is the authority of this church. What we're going to look at today is what a proper biblical church is, sort of the history of the church. But really, there's a problem out there today. There's a bunch of fake churches. They're funny. It's like a circus. I call them a circus. They're a bunch of clowns. And we're going to look at how to keep the circus out of the churches. Amen. We're going to look at what the history of the biblical church is, and we're going to look at how to keep these false churches and these false doctrines, the leaven of the Pharisees, out of our church, and also how you can warn other people biblically what Jesus' church should look like, what God's church is according to the Scripture. And listen, you know, there are a lot of clowns out there claiming to be pastors. Yeah, they're all people that do not meet the requirements of a pastor, that don't uphold the scriptures as the authority in the church. There are corporations out there that claim to be, you know, a church that, are, that have nothing to do with the true gospel. There are others that's even worse where it's, it's like a family dynasty. It's like I've built my little kingdom, my little empire, and I'm going to hand it down to my son because I've got this great big corporation. And that's not really biblical. You know, I, I love Steadfast Baptist Church, and one day, Lord willing, this church will change names, and, and, and we'll move down the road. We're going to grow, and, and even with, with that, I, I do not hope to hand it to my son. I hope that my sons become preachers or pastors, but yet that they would go somewhere else and start their own. Listen, a church should not be some family dynasty of, well, well how, how did he become a pastor? Well, daddy gave it to him. Look, that's not biblical. And there's a problem. I think there's, there's a problem with the authority. And when the authority is the family dynasty or my daddy gave me the church, that sort of thing, there's a big problem. And, you know, the church has a couple main purposes. And the few that we're going to look at today is essentially how it's for discipleship, it's for fellowship, and it's for worship. Listen, as discipleship, we come together to learn the Word of God. Right? For fellowship, to provoke each other unto love and to good works, to encourage each other, right? And we worship. We come together, we pray, we sing unto God. That's the worship aspect, and that's what it's for. And Jesus here is saying he builds his church, and according to the Bible, things should be done decently and in order. A church should not be a free for all, a church should not be a place where we want to appeal to the world. Well, let's make ourselves worldly so when a worldly person comes in, they feel comfortable. That's not what the church is. The church is for saved people. In fact, the church is saved people. The church itself, is, it's, it's a congregation. It's an assembly. It's not a building or a corporation. You have to understand this. this these walls, this is not the church. The church is who I'm looking at right now. The church is the assembly of saved people. The church is not a, a building or a corporation. And, and although those things are needed to help move things along, hey, we could have church without a building, but it would be a lot better. It would be easier to meet in the same place every week. You know what I mean? We can go meet in a park, but when it's raining, people won't. I mean, think about it. We need a building. It makes things better. You know, but the church is really the people. And if we met in a different building next week, we're still the same church. We're still the same body of believers. And a lot of people have misunderstandings about what church is. And, and you know, there's a lot of it. Today, there is an attack on the biblical church. And I think the attack on the biblical church is, be, is a result of the unbiblical church, of the fake churches, this circus church that's out there, that it's, it's do whatever you want, and we want to please you, we want to entertain you. Look, if you don't like my preaching, you know, look, it's, it's the Word of God. 
My goal is to say what God says, and if you don't like what God says, I'm not going to try to entertain you. We're not going to have a dog and pony show up here. You know, we're not going to get blue lights and blue hair and, you know, all the things that the world wants to have. We're going to do it God's way. Amen. We're an old-fashioned church, and by old-fashioned, we're going to go back to the Word of God, and He tells us what the church should do, how it should look like, how it should operate, even how we should have correction inside of the church. And the church is not a new thing. In Hebrews 12, he says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Right? He's talking about New Jerusalem up in heaven. He says, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. There is a church in heaven. One day we will all come together. Every person that's ever been saved, he calls it the general assembly and church of the firstborn. He calls it New Jerusalem. Look, we do not believe in a universal church, right? The word Catholic means universal. They're not even Christian. Yeah. They're pagan. They're, it's full of idolatry and perversion. That's not Christian. That's not God's church. That's a fake church. It's a circus. It's a, I mean, a bunch of sideshow freaks. They, they make idols and statues. They make things with their hands and say, that is God and it's wicked as hell. And those same people are they're full of perverts. The Catholic Church is full of perversion. They're hurting innocent people. And the world looks at that and say, well, those Christians. No, those are not Christians. Those people should be judged according to God. Those pervert pedophiles, according to the Bible, they should be put to death. But our unrighteous government won't judge that. They won't do what's right. Look, we're not a universal church, but one day we will be together. One day we will all come together. When the Bible says the church, usually it's talking to the church at Galatia, the church at Ephesus. If Pastor Romero wrote us a, a, an epistle, if he wrote us an email or made a, hey, the church in Jacksonville needs more chairs. Is he talking about every person everywhere that's always been saved? No, he's saying the assembly, the congregation of people, when they come together, we need something. So in the Bible when it says the church, it's not saying all churches everywhere. It's not saying all believers everywhere. It's very specific. So we're talking about churches today and how they should operate, the history of churches, and then the problem with all the fake churches that are out there. Again, this is a local body. Right? It's part of God, of God. He says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. What he's saying is, this is Christ's body. Jesus Christ loves the congregation of believers. We come together. He is our God. He is our Savior. And we come together. And this is something special. This is something that we should not forsake. This is not something we should take for granted. I am so thankful that we have a good church to go to. We've got good friends. And when you decide to go to church, you're separating yourself. You're dividing yourself from your old friends, your old family. And are you going to lose friends to go to church? Yeah, but you know what? God has better friends for you. Amen. Why don't you look around? God has some better people for you to associate with, but you need to be willing to sacrifice to get there. It's a local body. It's what you see right here. This is the church. Right? Fort Worth is having church this morning. Steadfast Baptist Church is having church in Fort Worth. That is a different church. It's a totally separate church. We both have the same authority. It's Jesus Christ. It's a different congregation. It's a different assembly. So that's the first thing to remember is it's not universal. Um, also, people will say, well, well, didn't the church start here in Matthew 16? This is a very common thing. Well, they say, well, it started. Jesus started the church. And others would argue, well, the church age started somewhere in Acts, you know. And, and the church age is not biblical. And that is not true. The church has actually always existed, biblically speaking. In Hebrews chapter 2, he says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praises unto thee. He's actually quoting the Old Testament in Psalm, and he's saying, in the midst of the church, that's quoting Psalm 22, 22, where he says, in the midst of the congregation. David was part of a church. David had a congregation he was part of, and guess what? We have a congregation that we are part of. David will be in New Jerusalem one day, just as much as we will be in New Jerusalem one day, right? That church of the firstborn in heaven. We're, we're all saved. We're all going to go to the same place eventually. So the church didn't just start in Matthew 16. It didn't start in, in Luke chapter, or John chapter 20. It didn't start in Acts chapter 2. The church was around from the beginning when believers came together and congregated in the name of God. 
Listen, that's been the principle all along. That's why they had a tabernacle. That's why they had a temple. That's why they had priests and Levites to teach the word of God. And that's the purpose of church here. And oh, well, Brother Fan, are you, are you teaching replacement theology? Are you saying the church has replaced Israel? Well, not exactly, but yes. What do I mean by that? Well, Israel, the true Israel, remember they're not all of Israel, which are of Israel. Why? Because they fell away because of unbelief. Do you know there are unsaved Israelites that were never part of the church? Do you know that there were people of the nation of Israel that believed God, they believed that promise, they were saved, they are part of the church. They were part of the congregation, the assembly of believers. When they read the Word of God, they, they believed it. They were saved. So those same people we will see in heaven. We will not see all Jews or all Israelites in heaven. That's a, a, a false statement. And the Catholic Church tries to say that the Catholic Church replaced the nation of Israel. Look, the nation of Israel wrong, is wrong. The Catholic Church is wrong. It's been believers all along. That's all there is. To be part of the church, this church, you have to be a believer. If you're sitting in here today and you're not saved, I don't care if you're in the congregation, you're not part of God's church. This is not part of the church that He is building. He's building it line upon line, right? The Bible talks about it. It talks about that we are built up on lively stones. It's like He's taking bricks of believers and He's building His house. And that house is his, where there are many mansions. It's where we will one day dwell. It's where our souls will meet together in heaven. The church has been given authority by God. And Jesus, he, you know, it's clear that He is the Son of God, right? He's the angel of the Lord, it talks about the Old Testament. It calls Him the Word of God. And that has always been the authority. In the Old Testament, when the congregation of believers came together, their authority was the angel of the Lord. It was the Scriptures. It was the oracles of God. Today we come together. What is our authority? The Word of God, Jesus Christ, whatever He says goes, it's not just my opinion. If I give you my opinion and it's a direct contradiction to the Scriptures, then I'm wrong. The Bible is right. This is the New Testament church. And guess what? There was an Old Testament church. And in Testament, it doesn't just mean the division in your Bible. It means the covenant, right? Just as much as what we just read in, in chapter 16 of Matthew about Peter, right? Jesus tells him he needs to be converted. Well, I thought Peter was saved. And listen, it was funny because somebody just asked me about the controversy about hell before the service. Peter was saved under the old covenant, and Jesus said, yet you still need to be converted. Right? Jesus, while he was alive, said, the new covenant is not yet available to you, but when it is, and you hear it, and you believe it, you'll be converted, you're saved, you'll have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Right? So that old covenant has passed away. You cannot be saved without Jesus Christ. This is very clear according to the Scriptures. So the New Testament church in the Bible is a little bit different than the Old Testament, but those Old Testament saints were part of a church, and one day they will be with, with us in the church in heaven. Does that make sense? All right. Moving forward, look at verse number 19. Verse number 19. And I will give unto thee the, kings, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now turn to Matthew 18. He's talking about you have authority in the church when God is our authority, He in turn gives us authority. There are certain things we're supposed to do His way, and when we're doing it the right way, He says whatever you bind on earth, He will bind it in heaven. He's saying when we do things the biblical way, He will see to that the, the needs that we have, the prayers that we have, they'll be answered in the heavenly way. Right? He's given us authority so long as we're under the proper authority, which is Jesus Christ. And it's interesting because, you know, we are an independent, fundamental Baptist church. We are independent. There is, there is no one that we don't have a Baptist pope, right? The pastor is in charge of the church. That's God's biblical method. We are fundamental. That means, hey, we're old school. We believe in the fundamentals of salvation. We believe the fundamentals of what the Bible teaches. That's the authority. We're Baptist. What does that mean? Well, we had John the Baptist. He was baptizing as a new, as a new, a, a, a new Testament church. 
We, it is Baptist. I mean, we are Christian, which is essentially a Baptist. We are the ones that believe what he said, and we do what he said. He said, go and be baptized. So both Baptist and Christian may have been phrases that the enemy used to try to isolate us, but hey, we're just disciples of Jesus Christ. We're obeying what he said, and that's why we are IFB. We're Independent Fundamental Baptist Church. And some would even take it a step farther and say, well, we're the new IFB. One of the men last night said, we're the real IFB, and that makes a lot of sense. Because the old IFB, they're no longer independent. They don't believe in the fundamentals, right? They're not Baptist by tradition. They're now become Calvinist and everything else. They preach a strange gospel. They're, they're, not, they're not even an independent fundamental or Baptist anymore. Hey, but we are. We want, we want those things because that is biblical. So we are the real IFB. We're built on the Word of God as the authority. And, you know, there was this church I was in one time over in Pensacola, Florida, and it was King James only. It was Independent Baptist Church, and I was, I'd been looking for good churches, and I thought, well, man, this seems like it. It's this little country church. It seems to be right on everything. Pastor seems real humble, but he wasn't really independent. He would have Pensacola Christian College. He would have the local Christian college would say, well, we have these guys. We want you to give them a chance to preach. We want you to bring them under your wing. And he had people that worked for the college that worked in the church also. And he had all these strange ties, and it became very clear when one of them messed up at the college where they were no longer allowed in the church. It's like, well, wait a minute. He didn't do anything to be kicked out of church, but yet the pastor said, well, the college doesn't like you anymore, so I don't like you anymore. Right, so he's not independent. He was tied to a college, which Jesus Christ did not establish a college. He established a church, a congregation of believers. It is to be independent of every other church. Its head is to be Christ. But those churches don't have that. You know, and it's funny because he was King James only also. And I sat in his sound booth and I did his video for a long time. And I, and I started to notice things that in the King James Bible, there are certain words that are a little bit more difficult to understand at first if you don't do your homework, if you don't look it up, if you don't research it. Well, instead of explaining it via the scriptures and using the Bible as a, as a dictionary, this man, I noticed he said something one time that triggered something. And I said, that's what the false Bible calls it. He, ju he just used a false Bible to define the King James. So I get on the computer, I start looking, and sure enough, that's exactly what the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, says. So anytime he got to one of these difficult words, like clockwork, he's quoting the New American Standard Bible, although it was a King James only in church. So there was a problem there. He didn't believe in the King James Bible. He didn't believe God could preserve his word. He thought he needed to go back to that Catholic Bible of Westcott and Hort, those perverts. And listen, if your church is tied to a college, you're not independent, right? If you're using one of those new Bibles that deletes verses, you're not very fundamental either, right? We are the real IFB. We want to do things the right way. Amen. Now look, you're in Matthew chapter 18. Look at verse number one. The Bible reads, And at, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. Now, where did the child come from? The child was there with them, right? This child is there with the parents listening to Jesus preach and, and, and the disciples wanting to puff themselves up a little. Well, who's going to be the best, right? Who's going to be the biggest up there? And he says, hey, come here, kid. You see this young child? that's in church, that's listening to the Word of God, that believes the preaching, this is the most valuable part of the kingdom of God. Right? So he called a child that was in the church, he brought it forward, and he used it to teach the disciples a lesson. Right? Don't puff yourself up, number one. But also that churches should be family integrated. Yeah. Right? These churches that try to say, well, you need to let us take your children in the back and let some other person teach them some other doctrine. No. Not just no, but I say hell no, because these, teacher, these, these doctrines they're teaching are wicked. These Baptist churches are teaching Pentecostal doctrine, the doctrine of devils straight out of hell. I say hell no. Not in this church. We are family integrated. The parents should be able to keep their eyes on their children so they're not wondering if somebody's going to hurt that child. I mean, it just blows my mind how churches in this city will badmouth our church for keeping the children around the preaching when these other Baptist churches in this city are full of perversion, there's been molestation because they did it wrong? Yeah. No. 
Yep. Not in this church. We're going to do it Jesus' way. Okay. It's called family integrated. Right. The children in the midst of them, that's biblical church. Amen. When you take the children out of church, guess what? You're not in the will of Jesus Christ anymore. You're no longer doing it the way that Jesus did it. You're doing it your own way. It's a private interpretation. Look at verse number 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. Listen, when the, when the children start crying in church and it becomes a, a pain in the neck to you, humble yourself, receive them. If there's a child making noise and hitting their chair and they're, they're, just, they're just being, I'm trying to pay attention, hey, humble yourself, receive them. They need to hear this. The children are sponges. They learn more than you realize. And, and you, know, you know who their heroes are? It's you that are in the church. It's you adults that come to church, that go out soul winning. One of the little girls in the church wrote my daughter a note saying that she was praying that she would become a soul winner. Now that's awesome. Yeah. You don't get that in these old IFB churches. Right. You don't get it in these circus churches that don't even preach the gospel. It's all about the lights, the show, drop your kids off, they're going to be over there, sign this waiver form so if we molest them we're, you can't sue us. Talk about strange. Man, these churches are wicked. There are strange churches out there that are destroying the world's image of God's church. We're going to do things God's way and we're going to trust Him to bless us. Look at verse number 6. Whoso, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the seas. Look, there's a couple of applications here. Number one, don't, don't just be quick to rebuke a child in the church and offend them in the church. But also, he's talking about offenders. What, what's a child offender? Right? They're abusers, they're perverts, they're pedophiles, and Jesus is saying they're better off to commit suicide. You know, it's biblical for a pedophile to commit suicide so that their hell is not as bad, because if they continue in that course, guess what? It's going to be a hotter hell, it's going to be more torture. God will judge them. I was speaking with somebody yesterday that, that works in corrections, and they see these type of people. Well, what do you think? Can they change? No, I don't think so. I keep seeing it. Well, this guy, he professes, a go I've repented of all my sins. I want to get it right. And guess what happens? Three years later, busted. Same thing, same problem. It's like their mind is defiled, their conscience is seared, and all they can do is think about hurting people. Listen, that's why we have a no homo policy. That's why we're family integrated. Child offenders should not come in the church. And we're on the look for people like that. And, and guess what? Beware. If they show up, Jesus is saying, it's better for you that you'd hang yourself. So if somebody comes in the church like that, don't worry, God will get them. God will expose them. And in the meantime, we're going to be vigilant and we're going to protect the children. We're going to be on the watch and make sure that they're safe. You know, and it's funny because these other churches, they have the Sunday school program. That's a failure. The Sunday school program is a copycat of the public school system. Take them from their parents, make them learn something different, let them collar, let them draw, give them some candy. That's not church. Look, there's a whole generation lost in these other Baptist churches because they gave their kids up to Sunday school. And guess what? They never came back. I mean, when they got to be teenagers, they still, well, can't we have a youth church? I don't want to go out there with the adult. Hey, grow up. Be an adult. Listen to the preaching. Learn the hymns. Sing like us. Don't go in the back and sing rock music. Don't go in the back and let some short-haired woman teach you. These Baptist churches that are doing that, they're, they're under a curse. They're losing their very own children, and they can't figure out why. Send them off and have somebody else train them. Why don't you take the responsibility for yourself and train your own children? God has commanded you to do it, and if you don't do it, then you're failing as a parent. And look, we're not going to fail as, as a church. We're going to let the children stay in here with us, even if they're noisy. We're going to love the children. We want them to be trained up in the Word of God. And these Christian colleges talk about failures. Who was somebody last week was telling me about his pastor? I'm getting. I think it was Brother Owen was telling me about his pastor. Well, you're getting really involved, and I like what you're doing. You're on fire. You're a soul winner. His pastor says, "Well, what you need to do is go off to Pensacola Christian College for four years, 
Well, then what? So, so what? the pastor is shooting himself in the foot. He's, it's like a, a self-destruction. Wow, I've got somebody that's talented. They're on fire for the Lord. They know the Bible. They're a soul winner. What I want you to do is to leave us. Leave the flock. Leave the church that God established. And go to a corporation that's going to teach you strange doctrine. And then maybe you can come back and then maybe you can serve under me. How about serve right now? Look, we have more men that are active in this church than probably churches three times our size. Why? Because it's, it's, it's where your heart is. You want to be a soul winner? Do you want to be a preacher? Guess what? It's available to you. We had a dozen guys preach last night, some of the best sermons I've heard in a while, some of which is the, some of the same stuff I'm saying today. So, uh, sorry we didn't record those sermons, but uh, don't worry, I'll cover your best points, all right? <laughs> Look, God has established a church for a reason. It's for your benefit. It's so you'll grow spiritually. And when you reject his method, his pattern, his doctrine, you're only hurting yourself. These other churches are intentionally becoming like a circus. They've let the leaven of the Pharisees come in, and the fruit is the destruction of their own family, the destruction of their own congregation. The church should be local. We should have internal uh, uh, correction when necessary. It shouldn't be something that we have to go to the world about. And, you know, these, these, co these Christian colleges are destroying little churches. Look at verse number 17 in this chapter. Matthew 18, 17, the Bible says, And if he shall neglect to hear them, let, or it says, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and as a publican. Look, church discipline has a pattern. It has a method. Everything should be in order, decently and in order. So according to the Bible here, just as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if there's somebody in sin, you deliver such an one unto the Satan. Get out of the church, go get it right, then you can be reconciled and come back in. When the church establishes something, when we say this is the Word of God, the Bible says we should do it this way. When somebody fights that, we say, you're just like a heathen, why don't you go? If, if you want to come in here and say, oh, no, I think we should speak in strange tongues. That's not according to the Bible. That's a strange doctrine. You're like a heathen to us. Get out of here. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? We establish the doctrines that God says, and he's telling us that whatever we bind on earth, he'll bind in heaven. If somebody comes in here and tries to teach the leaven of the Pharisees and say we have to work our way to heaven or repent of our sins, hey, you're like a heathen unto us. right? Let that person be accursed. You know, and it's just like the, that... That Glenwood Baptist Church down the road. I visited it here one time when I first moved here. Brother Graham hit on it last night. They've got Sunday school. They say that our church is wrong for not having Sunday school. But this guy has a strange gospel, right? He's a PhD. This pastor, uh, Michael, what's his name? O'Neill. Michael O'Neill. PhD, right? <laughs> PhD. Where'd he get that PhD from? from a little church called Victory Baptist Church in Milton, Florida. I know this church. I've been in this church. It's full of leaven and heresy. The fool that pastors that church says that when Jesus died on the cross, there were two malefactors on one side, because it says malefactors in this chapter, and there were two thieves on this side, so really there's five people on the cross. What? What kind of PCC garbage are you pumping down people's throat? Why can't you just cross-reference instead of saying, here it says thieves, here it says malefactors. He just added them up instead of comparing. Look, this church is on the repentance blacklist. I called the pastor, uh, Tim LaFleur, and I, and I had a, a friend there as a witness. I put him on speakerphone. I said, what would you tell a six-year-old child they would have to do to go to heaven? Well, they need to believe on Jesus and be willing to turn from all of their sin. A six-year-old child has to be willing to live a sinless life to go to heaven according to their strange gospel. So the fruit of that, this, this fruity Glenwood Baptist Church, which is a dead fruit, it's evil fruit, this pastor teaches that you can't just call on the name of the Lord and be saved. You can't just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So the sinner's prayer is unbiblical and you're not allowed to ask for it. And all. He's got all these strange doctrines that he teaches over there. And listen, the Bible says, let that man be accursed. Let him be as a heathen. When he rejects the clear scriptures, okay, well, we reject you. There's a problem with you. Oh, but, but he's more worried about Sunday school. This same guy has strange doctrines about soul winning. He doesn't actually do it. But he wants to say, we're wrong for helping people tell God they changed their mind. We're wrong for showing the scriptures that say, 
Call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Listen, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible means. Calling upon the name of the Lord is biblical. It's all the way back in Genesis. This is God's pattern. Salvation is by faith alone. And if you're not ashamed of the Lord and you believe in that free gift, just ask for it. Just reach out and take that gift. That's His promise. And it is to everyone. Everyone can be saved. And the guy is so messed up, he says, he says, the sinner's prayer is unbiblical. Anybody doing it's in heresy. But here's what you got to do. And he has these steps. You get down to like point number four, and he's like, then pray. I said, wait, I thought you said don't pray. He says, reach out, there, reach out your hand, and if they take your hand, it's like you, you know it's an assurance that they've believed it. I'm sorry, you know, look, I don't want strangers to hold my hand. Hold, okay, look. And if you, if you hold hands with people during your soul winning, I mean, you know, as long as you're preaching the gospel right, that's fine. And there are people that do that. I, that's old IFB, though. Instead of teaching them eternal security, instead of teaching them that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and went to hell, instead of teaching people they deserve to go to hell, then in teaching eternal security and teaching the sinner's prayer, they just give it, they keep it real short and sweet and assume that you've got the doctrine. That's wrong. Look, if you're not teaching that people deserve to go to hell in your soul winning presentation, you're doing it wrong. You need to fix that. This guy's so messed up. In, in, in the book of 3 John, verse 9, he says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. He's saying, I wrote to the church, here's some doctrine the church needs to hear, and this guy Diotrephes, he wants the preeminence. He wants to be above everybody else. He wants everybody to know how great he is, how wonderful he is. So when the man of God wrote, he rejected the scripture. He rejected the doctrine. It said he receiveth us not. So there's this warning about this guy. He had a self-doctrine. This is another thing you'll see in these circuses of churches. It's like, well, we don't believe the Bible like the traditional way. We, we come up with our own doctrine. Right? That's what this guy at Glenwood did. He's coming up with his own way to pray to the Lord, or to, to use the sinner's prayer, and he still uses it, but he, he goes against it, and he has a strange gospel. There are people that will have their own doctrine, and you guys have probably ran into this out soul winning, where it's like, well, you sound like you took a little bit of Seventh-day Adventism, and Jehovah's Witnesses, and Baptist, and Catholic, and you put it in a blender, and you call it your own doctrine. Right? That's what this Diotrephes was doing. He was setting himself as the authority, he is the standard in the church. And so when John wrote them, he rejected the scriptures. Therefore, John says, reject him. Don't follow evil. Follow what's good. He says, wherefore, if I come unto you, I re will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. He goes on. The point is that these people will attack the church of God for doing it the old-fashioned way for not trying their new way, you know, for not trying their circus. Hey, they can call us whatever we want, but we will not be a circus. We will do things decently and in order and under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a biblical church. Anything else is just some self-doctrine from a false prophet. Hey, they reject the scripture, mark them and avoid them. Have nothing to do with them. This old IFB circus, they had a bad gospel too. This is another thing that it just bothers me. When we were down in Orlando, I was talking with some of the, the pastors that came out of the old IFB about how back in the day he'd go out preaching and his pastor taught him, well, you, you give them the, the you know, four or five verses, you get them to pray, and then you teach them eternal security. And then you get them saved again. Listen, if you're doing that, stop doing that. The Bible's clear. You have to believe that it's eternal life. Yeah. Yeah. How can it be eternal? I don't understand how you can read half of these verses and not drive home the point. It says everlasting. Right. You can ask any unsaved person, how long does eternal last for? And they're going to say forever. They know what eternal means, but yet a bunch of old IFB Baptists can't figure it out. Why? Because they're not doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit. They're not doing it under the authority of the Scriptures. They're going to try some newfangled way. Let me pull out some track with five verses. And if I can just read these five verses and get, a, get you to pray with me, it's a success. Listen, that's wrong. That's bad. You know, and it, it makes me... This guy, T Tyler Doka. Great, great harvest, bastard church, as Brother Ben called it. Right there, a bunch of bastards. We had one, well, a young man visit from that church. He went out soul winning with one of our guys, and I just found this out. If I had known, I probably would have made a phone call earlier. But his soul winning presentation, it, it, 
He gets to the door. The lady's hungry, man. She wants to get saved. She wants to, she wants to know, right? Low-hanging fruit, you said, right? And this kid, well, okay, so here's this verse, here's that verse, never mentions hell. Isn't hell a sin? Don't you have to understand that we deserve hell for our sins? Yeah. He was about to get the lady to pray, and thank God our soul winner stepped in. Amen. And he said, wait, 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 hold on just a minute. Let me ask you a couple questions. And he starts from square one, and the lady had all the wrong answers. This guy was about to pray with her. This guy is wicked, right? He's under the leadership of Tyler Doka, this unsaved heretic in New York City. So our soul winner preaches the gospel. Our soul winner teaches hell. Our soul winner takes the time and tells her she deserves hell. And once you have eternal life, the free gift, it lasts forever. You can never lose it. There's nothing you can do to mess it up because it's his promise. He won't break the promise. Man, she was excited. She prayed. She thanked the soul winner. She prayed and got saved. Amen. And then turned around and said, you know what? I was about to pray and I had no idea what I was praying for. Listen, this ought to scare the fire out of you as a soul winner. If you're being lazy or quick or in a, if, you're, if you're just cutting corners, you're going to get somebody to commit to something they have no idea what it is. You might as well just take some weed seed and throw it in. Hey, I don't know. We'll just throw a bunch of 11 in the middle, right? You think about what you're doing. You might as well just throw a bunch of rocks in the field, whatever. You know what I mean? You're, you're perverting the gospel. You're making it harder for them to get saved in the future because their confidence was in a prayer. I've had people, oh, what do you have to do to be saved? Oh, just pray the prayer, man. Just pray the prayer. What prayer? What did you say? Do you even know? I don't know. Yeah, okay, you're not saved. Is there anything you can do to mess it up? I had a guy that literally had a beer in his hand. He's on the phone. Yep, no, I go down to Big Baptist Church. No, I'm good. What do you have to do? Just pray the prayer, man. Is there anything you can do to mess it up? Oh, yeah. Like what? You know, maybe drink. Come on, you know. Listen, if you're a drunkard, God will still save you. Amen. Even if you say, I can't get rid of this drunkenness. I don't want to get rid of this drunkenness. But I want that free gift. I want eternal life. God will still save you. Amen. These fools out there that preach you have to turn from all your sin to be saved. This old IFB, there's, there's no hell. There's no eternal security in their gospel. That is not the gospel at all. That is a circus. It's a sideshow. You might as well go with the Pentecostals and just one, two, three, repeat after me. Got another number. It's not about numbers. It's about souls comprehending the Word of God. If they don't understand it, they can't really trust in it. It is so important as a soul winner to be thorough, to be effective. Don't be like the old IFB circus, repent of your sins. Don't scare them with hell. You know, it's funny because I had somebody recently, I don't remember who it was, but well, I, I try not to talk about hell with old people. And I said, quite the opposite, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I've, worked, I've worked with old people. They, they have a more level head than uh, we do. They're probably thinking about the end of their life more than we are. Yeah. Right? You talk to an 80-year-old, they're probably thinking about dying every single day. And when you talk to them and you tell them you don't have to go to hell, it's real easy to go to heaven, they might actually want to hear that. They might actually be more interested than some young guy. Oh, I'll never die. What are you talking about? The old people know they're going to die. The old people don't want to go to hell, right? The old saying, everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die, right? The older generation, they're aware. They know that hell's real. They know they don't want to go there. Don't be afraid to preach it. If you're not preaching hell, you're not preaching the gospel. They have to understand that. You know, this Doka guy doesn't even meet the qualifications of a pastor. Yeah, right. The Bible's very clear in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 that a pastor must meet certain qualifications. Well, Tyler Doka was ordained by a Calvinist, from what I'm being told. A Calvinist, a man that he even would say was unsaved. And so now, he, well, okay, as long as he ordains me, I'll, I'll go start a new IFB church. Yeah, yeah. The devil's coming to, to, to steal and destroy the church and try to, try to destroy what, the soul-winning revival that's going across America. Well, he's a fake Baptist. Tyler Doka is not old IFB. He's not new IFB. He's not real IFB. He's not IFB. He's not even a Christian. This strange doctrine he's teaching that Christians go to, go to hell for a little while. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's like, it's like Calvinism mixed with Catholicism. Well, guess what? He came up with his own strange doctrine, just like he did the perspective of the earth doesn't meet the self-doctrine. Bad soul winner. And it's funny because we had that guy from his church that was a known bad soul winner. And then we had other people that came down from the church. And they're good people. They're saved. They're going there. And they, well, you know, the soul winning up there just, they went with me. 
wow, you spent like 25 minutes with them. And I'm like, I know, we got cut short. And he's like, no, I'm used to like seven to 10 minutes. Wow. What? Your pastor's teaching you that the gospel can be accomplished in seven minutes? Well, it's more about just praying the prayer. That's all they're about. All of their numbers are a lie. On their website, they've got thousands of numbers. Oh, we've got thousands of people saved. Yeah, with what? Three people? Ten people at the most? Uh, look, what Fort Worth is doing, a church of 160 to 70 people with 30, 40, 50 soul winners every week, they're doing 1,500, 2,000 souls a year. Guess what? It takes time to preach the gospel. But for them, all they want is to pray the prayer. Hey, look at this. Do you believe this? Yeah, it says this. Do you believe that? Will you pray with me? Or just pray real quick. No, just pray. Right? Just like that other guy, wicked as hell, he's probably unsaved himself to preach a gospel like that. Look, I want you to, I want you to look at verse number 18. Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He's talking about unity in the church. When we come together as a church, and if there's somebody that's coming in, and it's obvious that they're not sober, and we as a church judge thus, and it's like, you need to go somewhere else until you get that sobriety right. If you want to come into the church stoned off your gourd, and everybody in the church is like, there's a problem here. God, will you deal with that? The church's job is to judge that inside the church. Yes, to be judgmental, to say, God said no. God said be sober. God said somebody that's not sober should be kicked out of the church until they get it right. And as a church, when we agree on that in unity, guess what? God binds that in heaven. He says, you're right. Deliver such and one unto Satan. They shouldn't come back till they get it right. And if they refuse to get it right, God will judge their body. He may destroy their very body just to show them how much he loves them. Look at verse number 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Now look, this is not saying it's a do-it-yourself house church, right? The Bible has given us the scriptural authority. It's given us the scriptural pattern. Look, a church can start in a house, yes, but a church is not when two or three buddies get together and have a prayer meeting or have a Bible study. That is not the same as church. And today there are a lot of people that have forsaken church. They don't want to go to a church. I can see why with all the fake churches out there. So the result, because of the bad churches, it's a bad decision to just kind of self-church themselves. I'm going to self-ordain myself. I'm going to say that we are the church. And, you know, and this guy, uh, uh, Joshua Jocelyn, we're talking about, he tried to start a house church. And I know one of the guys that was sitting in the congregation when he started it, and he said it was the weirdest thing he's ever seen. He said, this guy preaches a repent of your sins gospel. There's three people in there. His wife's in the kitchen playing the piano. They're yelling to each other through the kitchen. And he's all right, let's pass the plate. And his buddy's like, pass the plate? Just me. Yeah, well, we got to start raising some money so we can pay the rent around here. And What? What in the world? I, look, these people want to start a false church and a home church just for their own advantage. So they can have the preeminence. So they can say, my church. Look, when I say my church, I mean my people. I mean our church. When I say my church, I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about my group of friends that we come together, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not, I own this church. No, Jesus owns this church and I take part in it. I have my part in it. This is my church. Amen. Right? People use that word my the wrong way sometimes. But you're in Acts chapter 2. I want you to see this. Find verse number 46. Verse number 46, it says, And they, continuing daily with one accord, in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now notice they're in one accord in the temple. And then they went and fellowshiped from house to house. They went soul winning from house to house. They, they spent time together. People will use this verse to say we should, have, we should start a house church. Well at this time the temple is where the believers were before Jesus and after Jesus, the Christians were meeting there, reading the scriptures, preaching the gospel, obviously until they began to be persecuted, and they spread out and started other churches. So they're fellowshipping in houses, but they are having church in the 
the church location, the temple, the building. Does that make sense? So you can't use this verse to justify forsaking the assembly and starting your own because things should be get like things. I am a human being. My children are human beings, right? We are a church. We were begotten of another church. Fort Worth is giving birth, and one day we're going to cut the umbilical cords, and we will be a 100% independent Baptist church standing on the Word of God as the authority. We should look like what we came from. So when somebody comes from a Calvinist church to start a Baptist church, there's already a problem there. Because next thing you know, they're teaching Catholic doctrine. Go figure, right? It's, strange. it's a false prophet will beget another false prophet. Any man that would sit under an unsaved pastor and say, yeah, ordain me, lay hands on me, I wonder about them. They may also be a false prophet. Look at verse 47 here. Look at the next verse. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord, you hear that? The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Two things here. Number one, Christ is building the church. Number two, the saved went to church. The church was not the place to get saved, although if a visitor comes, we're going to preach the gospel to them. The church is for saved people. We are not going to appeal to the worldly. Go to Acts chapter 7. Look, and there's another problem, there, this whole uh, church age thing. People like to use Acts chapter 2 and say that's when the church age started. Prior to that, there was no church. Well, guess what? That's a lie. That makes Matthew 16 messed up. That makes Ec the book of Exodus, right? The church in the wilderness. It existed back then. David was in the church. It talks about in Psalm 22. Those churches existed. So you can't say there was an age of the church because these same people, you know, the, they call it also the, the grace, the age of grace. These same people, like uh, this Peter Ruckman, who, who knows who Peter Ruckman is? This is his most published uh, book. This guy writes hundreds of books. I want you to listen to what he teaches. He believes that we are in the church age, or the age of grace, and now is the only time people can be saved by faith. He believes everybody else worked their way to heaven. He says, if you miss the rapture, start working your way to heaven immediately. What? work your way to heaven. That's so contrary to what the scriptures say. He says a man must keep the commandments and keep them to the end. If he doesn't, he loses his salvation and burns in hell. He t he, so does he believe eternal security? No. Does he believe salvation by faith alone? No, this guy's a heretic. This is called dispensationalism. This is the fruit of Zionism. And the end goal is to set up an antichrist. And they want to tell you that there was a beginning of the church age. And there's an end to that church age. And afterward, what? What? Then the antichrist kingdom? What? What are they going to tell you? What strange doctrine is next? Look here in Acts chapter 7. Find verse 37. It says, This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him you shall hear. Right? This is foretelling Jesus Christ. Look in the next verse. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles to give unto us. The lively oracles is talking about the living word of God. He said he had the word of God. It was to give to us. Moses was with the church in the wilderness. Who's there with him? The angel of the Lord. The word of God. Jesus Christ was ahead of that church also. Those things work together. It's the same pattern that we have today. And he makes it. So that was back in the book of Exodus. Go to the next chapter, Acts chapter 8. Listen, dispensationalism is a circus. It is a circus. It is the goofiest way to try to explain the Bible away. Oh, you're reading what chapter? Oh, that's not for you. That's for the Jews. Well, wait a minute. When you say Jews, the Bible uses that word as people that were of the tribe of Judah. Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, no. I mean the religion. Oh, you mean the religion of the Jews that Paul said was unsaved? Well, I mean, what do you mean when you say the word Jews? Even that word, dispensationalism, literally comes from unsaved people. Anybody that believes in dispensationalism and they want to argue with you, ask them that one question. Was the founder of dispensational theology a saved man? And you want to see him squirm? You want to see him change the subject? You want to see him answer any other question but that question alone? Because they know that it came from a devil, but they want to believe it. They want to cling to it. Look, you're in Acts chapter three, Acts chapter eight. Look at verse number three. 
as for Saul, right, he's unsaved at this point, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Go to the next chapter, Acts chapter 9. Saul made havoc of the church, an unsaved man in the Jews' religion, attacking saved people, attacking his very countrymen that said the Messiah had come. He was attacking the churches. He was attacking the people, going into their house, dragging them out. What would you do this morning if the cops showed up and they had a rabbi there and the rabbi said, everybody that claims Jesus, we're going to put them in prison this morning. What would you do? Bring it on. Here, you want me to take my wallet out before you handcuff me? Let's go. Seriously, what's your, I mean, do you understand that a time of tribulation will come upon the earth and they will carry you before synagogues, is what Jesus said. And they say, oh, well, that's just for the Jews. Well, then why is it the synagogues are going to be persecuting believers? Dispensationalists, Zionism, it's because they don't believe the scriptures. Paul was not saved here. He made havoc of the church. Now, now then he gets saved, right? And what he referenced back before he was saved in Galatians chapter 1. In verse 13, he says, For ye have heard of my conversion in the time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Paul's saying, now I'm saved, now I'm part of the church before I was in that anti-Christ religion. Yeah. Literally, anti-Jesus Christ. That's what the Jews are. The New Testament or the New Covenant church was built upon the Old Covenant, the Old Testament church. You know, Peter was saved when Jesus was speaking to him. And when in, in John 20, when he breathed on them and gave them the Holy Ghost, Peter was saved when he understood the new covenant as well. He didn't have to get re-saved, but he had to believe that new covenant. And I believe that anybody that was saved would have. Whereas Paul was an unsaved Jew. He did not believe the old covenant. He was doing it the Pharisees' way, the leaven of the Pharisees. Their doctrine was repent of your sins. Their doctrine was to be seen of men. So when Paul heard the new covenant... That's when he first got saved. That's when he was converted from Saul. You're in Acts chapter 9, find verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Right? Why? Saul was a murderer of Christians, right? He was converted by the gospel. Look at verse 31. Then, right, so they received Paul. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Go to chapter 11. So listen, the purpose of the church is for discipleship, fellowship, and worship. Anything else is not doing it God's way. There's a bunch of circuses trying to get into churches and get them to change their way, and it's wicked. Here we see the churches had rest. They were edified. They were built up. Why? Because they were afraid of the Lord. They were saved. They had the Holy Spirit. You're in Acts chapter 11. Find verse 22. Verse number 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came, had seen the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. You hear that? Exhort. This is the purpose of church. Discipleship. Encouraging each other. Fellowship. Look at verse 24. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and faith, and much people was added to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when they had found him, this is a very important verse, I want you to pay attention. Verse 26. And when they found him, he brought them unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. There's several things happening in this one verse. This is the first mention of the word Christian, and it defines it in context. I had a Seventh-day Adventist tell me one time that he was a Christian too, and I took him to this verse and proved that he wasn't, and he had to agree that he wasn't. Look what it says here. They assembled themselves with the church. If you go back, it talks about the believers in Jesus Christ were assembled. This church is the assembly. 
its disciples. He says he taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians. How do you become a Christian? You put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then what? You assemble, you disciple. The purpose of the church is for discipleship. Now that you're here, it's time to grow. If you don't come to church, you will not grow spiritually. So this Christian name is used for the assembled disciples. It says they taught much people. That's the goal of the church. The goal is to teach you the Word of God. Go to Acts chapter 20. We have to beware of fake churches. Their goal is to not, their goal is to teach you something else, right? Literally to teach you strange doctrine, to get money out of you. Matthew 28, you know what Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, right? Teaching them. Preach and teach. That's our goal is so that we can learn here and we can go out and get others saved. That's the purpose of the church. And there are fake churches that mock God's methods. And they're a bunch of circus clowns. They're, they want to market to you. They're falsehood and lies. They want to pull you away from the truth. Oh, you do it that old-fashioned way. We, you know, I just got a postcard in the mail this week from some church. It doesn't have a denomination. It says they're relevant. It says they have a modern worship. And they're going to meet in the local school. And if you show up, they're going to, they're going to feed you lunch. And it's some big postcard. It doesn't tell you what they believe, where they came from, what church sent them. Guess what? They're not a church. They're using the name church to try to get to the people. There are people that want to know God. They want to know the truth. They want to be saved. And the devil's out there with a, just trying to gather them in. Come on into my place. Come in and believe my lie. Let me tell you that if you just keep coming back and giving us money and saying you're sorry for your sin, you might make it to heaven, but you could lose that. That's wicked. Yes. Look, the Bible's clear. You don't have to come to our church to go to heaven. You have to believe the gospel. Yes. And hey, when I tell people, I'd love for you to come to church, but if I don't see you in church, if you've believed the gospel, I'll see you in heaven. That's the end game. So how do you get rewarded when you get to heaven? You grow. You obey. Well, how do you know what to obey and how to grow? You come to church. Jesus established this local body. This local body, here's our authority, the Word of God. We're going to stand on that. We're going to obey that. It is over us. The author and finisher of our faith. Guess what? The author has all authority in this church. This is what we're following. Amen. There are many fake churches out there, and they're doing damage to true Christianity. Yeah. We are true Christians. We're Baptists. We're independent. We're fundamental. We want to do it God's way. And they all teach something different out there. And I want to warn people. You need to tell other people they've got to get in church. They will never grow. There's, there's a couple young men that came and visited when Pastor Anderson preached for us. The church, they go to the 1122 church. Who's heard of that? Okay. They go to one of the campuses of 1122, and they don't preach the gospel. They're not saved, but they get to go off into a back room into a Sunday school and they get to hang out and then flirt with a bunch of girls and they're more worried about that than they are their spiritual growth. When they get to heaven, they will not have as much reward as the person that says, well, all my friends aren't here and it's not easy. I got to drive across town, but you know what? I'm going to go hear the word of God. I want my children to hear it. I need to hear it. I want to grow. God will reward and bless that. Amen. Those guys that are 15 minutes away in the false church, what growth do they have? They should be ashamed of that false church. It's sad, but that's, that, they're, they're drawn in by the lust of the flesh. Look, you're in Acts chapter 20. We're almost done here. Acts chapter 20, look at verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, turn from your error, turn from your religion, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. These false prophets want to say, oh, well, you have, nowhere in the Bible does it say, turn from unbelief. Well, I didn't say that. The Bible didn't say that. It says repent. It means turn to God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your trust that He alone saves. It does not say repent of your sins. Yeah. The same person that, well, it doesn't say repent of your unbelief. I know, and it doesn't say repent of your sins either. Right. These false prophets, these liars... They want to pervert the gospel. Well, you got to turn over a new leaf. No, you don't. All you have to do is believe. Look, we had somebody else. Oh, you guys teach there's never any time for repentance. That's not true. Once you're saved, you need to repent of your sins every day. You do not repent of your sins to be saved. 
If you believe that gospel, you need to repent of that repentance. You need to turn to God, believe the gospel as it says here, trust in Him alone. And then, for your discipleship and your growth, get the sin out of your life. These same churches, they don't preach against sin. They preach repenting your sins every week. We preach faith alone, free gift, and once you're saved, I'm going to rip your face off. I'm going to preach against your sin. And it's not because I'm after you. It's because I'm reading what God said, and I love you, and I love me enough to read it and proclaim it. Well, what if that sin applies to you, Brother Fan? Well, I better read it twice then. <laughs> we all need to hear these things. I'm not above you. I'm of you. We're all working together to do it God's way. And there's so many false religions and fake churches out there that repent of your sins. That is the enemy. Yeah. That is the enemy. That is every other religion. Like, 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 like Brother Brian said last night, they, they turn, turn salvation into discipleship. Right. Discipleship is get in here and let me preach against your sin. Yep. That's not salvation. That won't get you saved. Right. Look at verse 24 in this chapter. But none of those things moved me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Listen, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You have a ministry. You should finish your course with joy. Don't worry about the things you're going to go through. What do you need to do? Your ministry, which is to testify the gospel. Look at verse 25. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Can you say I'm pure of the blood of all men? Well, I don't have any blood on my hands from the strangers whose door I knocked, but my family, boy, that's awkward. <laughs> yeah, so what? Well, I mean, I'm not going to go to my neighbor's house and tell them they're going to hell. I have to live next to them. You've got blood on your hands. We all need to knock our own neighborhood. Look what he says in verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. How serious is God about the church? He purchased it with his blood. If you're in the congregation today and you're saved, He purchased you with His blood. He wants you to be here to grow. If you forsake that, you're not going to grow. He makes it clear here, though, that we need to take heed to ourselves, right? And the flock. Look, if you're not the evangelist, if you're not the preacher, if you're not the pastor, you still need to take heed to the flock. You need to be encouraging each other, helping each other grow, taking care of your own children, making sure they understand. And He's clear here that He had not shunned to declare the counsel of God. He can say, everybody I met, I had friends that come. I, I've gotten calls. Boy, our friends, they got really offended when we came to church. They're definitely not coming back. But there's no blood on my hands. When I stand before God, He'll say, thank you for loving me more than them. I'll reward you for that. I'll bless you for doing that. That's the attitude we need to have. We are the flock of God. We're the church of the living God, right? We're fed with the Word of God. If you're saved, He's purchased you with His own blood. And this is God's method for growth. Churches are under attack today, especially by false churches. It's no marvel, it's no wonder that a bunch of fake churches want to attack us. Will you guys let the kids stay in the church? Yep, that's what Jesus did. Yep. Will you guys think you can just go out and preach the gospel and people can get saved? Yep, that's what Jesus did. <laughs> Hello, we're following Him. You're not following me, we're all following the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the pattern, that's the plan. Look at verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Right away, he talks about the church. He talks about salvation. He talks about preaching the gospel. And he says, look out. Beware. Does this sound familiar, guys? Romans 1. Anybody can be saved. It's the power of God unto salvation unto all, unto everyone. But look out. There's certain people. They're false prophets. They've rejected me. They're out to attack you. Beware. Look what he says. Not sparing the flock, right? Grievous wolves. Every time the Bible uses the word wolf about a prophet, they are unsavable. Old and New Testament, these are people that work for the devil. They are sons of the devil. 
They want to fleece you for material gain. That's the whole goal of these fake churches. They want to preach a strange gospel and muddy the water. They want to confuse it. Look at verse 30. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. This is, I mean, our church is a, a, a one year old. And we've had people in this congregation that were not saved, that were saying perverse things like they wanted to draw people away. We had to kick them out. It's not, I mean, we're only one year old and this has already happened. It's happened to many other churches. Well, you know, Jesus isn't really God. He, he became God. What? Drawing disciples away. How many other churches have had this? He didn't always exist. He became God when he got baptized. What? What kind of strange doctrine, perverse things? Listen, there are false prophets that will come into this church. I don't know of any right now, but look, one day we may have to kick somebody else out of this church, and it will be no wonder all of us will be like, yeah, you know what? He said this. He said that. They said this. They, they were trying to draw us away and get us away from the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the Word of God. He's saying they're from inside the church. False, that's where false prophets want to operate. They want to make this place a circus, but look, we're going to do it God's way, decently, and in order. Look at verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul is saying, hey, I warned you, I warned you, I warned you, it's going to happen. Why do we talk so much about false prophets and fake churches and fake gospels? Why do we talk about that so much here? That's part of discipleship. Jesus taught his disciples about the doctrine of the Pharisees. He said they are the serpent seed. He called them a generation of vipers. He said they're a child of hell. And can you imagine the publican, Jesus' disciple, the man that was a sinner that had a bad job, that worked for the government, that enslaved them, right? This publican that got saved, standing there with the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, you're rebuking the religious crowd? But they have all this knowledge of the Bible, of, of the law. He says, yeah, do what they're saying, but don't do like them, because they don't believe it. Can you, I mean, it's like the publicans versus the Pharisees. The publicans are sinners, and thank God we're saved. There are men in here that have not always been in church that are saved right now. You have more power of the Holy Spirit on your life than these false churches that have been to fake Bible colleges that preach a fake gospel. I don't care if they know the Bible better. I don't care if they know their doctrine better and, and they know the history of the Bible better. You have the power of God's Holy Spirit on your life, and He wants you in church to learn and grow. Amen. He wants you to go out soul winning. In 1 John 1, he says, before he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. There are a lot of false prophets and false churches. He said, there must be heresies among us so that those who are approved will be manifest. We'll know what's right when we see these false prophets come up. In 2 Peter 2, he said, he said there will be false prophets among you, even out as there shall be false teachers. There are going to be false teachers and false prophets try to come into this church just as we've eyewitnessed with other churches. Hey, stand fast. Get in the Word. Stand on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God is your authority. Stand on that above me, above Pastor Romero, above Pastor Anderson. You need to make this your authority. And if there's something you disagree with and you have a biblical stance and it's not worthy of separation, just, okay, cool, that's all right. But I, I think I get it better now. You know, but listen, God has ordained a church and people will come in and they won't want to do it our way. And they're going to fight, and they're going to try to destroy the church. They're going to try to devour you. And he warned us over and over and over that they, about, there's false prophets. They're, they will make merchandise of you. They want to steal money from you. False brethren brought in unawares, it talks about. Beware. There are fake churches with fake gospels. They're fake Christians. And listen, that's a circus. That's a freak show. It is not the church of God. We must stand strong on what He's given us. In Hebrews, He says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. I am to provoke you to good works. I am to provoke you to be loving as a Christian. You need to love each other in here. You need to forgive each other. I am to challenge you to do the good works. Which is what? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As the manner of some is, 
but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. When I see people missing from church, it hurts my heart. What's going on? Where are they at? Have they forsaken us? I don't know what blessing God has for us today, but they're not getting it. They can listen online, but it's not the same. It's not just the fellow, it's, it's not just the discipleship. It's also the fellowship and the worship. God brings everything together for a purpose. So listen, I'm here to provoke you. Don't forsake church. Don't forsake your own discipleship. Take heed unto your doctrine. Find out what you believe. Make this your authority. And when you see one of these funny churches, warn people about those false prophets. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this congregation that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for the blessings you've given us over this past year. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be encouraged and exhorted to continue to not forsake church, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would give us the wisdom and the discernment to be aware of these fake churches that are not doing things your way. Lord, I pray that you would give us power as we go out and preach the, Holy, preach the gospel today, Lord. I pray you'd help us to do it in the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray you'd help us to get some people saved. Lord, we love you. We love the church that you've given us. Thank you for these people, Lord. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Excuse me real quick. 